Today's dis discussion is an extension of the Hardy-Weinberg equation that we learned about in the last video, where we learned about P and Q and the two equations that can calculate the allele frequency of a generation. Hardy-Weinberg took this step and applied it to evolution in the sense that what they said is there are these five provisions, and if you can abide by these five provisions, you're going to prevent the change of DNA in that species. And, and that's the whole heart of evolution, is if you change the DNA, you will in essence evolve the population. So they came up with a hypothetical scenario. So this is something that does not actually happen, but it's hypothetical in the, fa the fact that we, they found out that if you do these five things, you're going to keep the P and the, the Q value the same. So for instance, if P, the dominant allele, was 70% of the population, Q would thus have to be 30. And if you abide by these five rules, you would maintain that same equilibrium. That's where the term e genetic equilibrium comes from. You would maintain that same uh, P and Q variation. So the first rule, in order for population to maintain genetic equilibrium, that means not evolve. The population must be large. And that's infinitely large, and you might think that the human population is large, so we're good by there. Genetic drift is the... Um, random allele changes due to chance. We can't control if a dominant or recessive allele is passed on for any heterozygous individual. It's just a game of chance. And what this says is in a large population, genetic drift happens, but you don't see it as often because they kind of compensate. The best example I can think of is for a family uh, where you have males and females, you should have about a 50-50 chance of having males and females. In a family that has four children versus a family that has a very large, we'll just say 20, you would tend to see a closer 50-50 relationship between boys and girls in a 20 sample size than 4. Just in math, that's how it works. The larger the sample size, the closer to the expected value you would get. So in a small population, genetic drift is something that you see more often. You're going to see changes in allele frequencies, and that's the whole uh, change in evolution if you have a smaller population. Population bottleneck is the idea that you have a large supply of population size, and they dwindle down to a bottleneck size. So this kind of smaller version right here says that the population got small. Then as humans, we somewhat try and repopulate it. So the before aspect, we had a large number of organisms. So think of something that has a, an endangered value. So if we think of uh, you know panda bears and things like that that you know have a very limited supply, they get down to a small size, and then they repopulate. The difference between these two is that there is genetic diversity here. They lack diversity here. And that's not good for evolution, because if the environment changes, that lack of diversity could affect the entire population and thus really wipe them out much quicker than that original population dwindled. The second. There must be random mating. Artificial selection, also known as selective breeding, is where individuals choose specific organisms to pass on. So we're basically, in essence, controlling what alleles pass on to the next generation. That is going to affect the P and Q value if we select one allele over the other. Assortative mating is where you pick mates based on similar characteristics. So humans would do this process where we're picking mates based on, a, on a, an idea of what we like to see in the mate. Organisms do this out in the wild with maybe assortative mating is dance uh, a male that has to dance for his female in birds. So these are certain characteristics they look for. It is not random mating. The third no mutations may occur. You can't avoid mutations, but Hardy-Weinberg said, if you don't want to evolve, you better prevent mutations from happening. The fourth, there is no immigration or emigration. With immigration, new alleles come into the population. With emigration, some alleles go. So the fluctuation of P and Q will change as alleles come in and out of a population. The fifth is that you can have no natural selection.
No natural selection. So survival of the fittest doesn't happen. The idea that all people can, can reproduce an equal amount, that's what's going to happen in that scenario. So all five of these are never, uh, they're, they're not going to be abided by. So therefore, this kind of says that evolution, we can't stop. Those five things are going to happen. So there are three types of natural selection. So I'm going to skip ahead two things here. Um, there are three types you have them drawn, or the names are there. The first one is directional. The easiest way to describe these is based on a little graph. So what this says is there is a particular phenotype, and right in the middle is the average of some continuous phenotype. And I'll give you some examples. Then you can kind of think of this as the chance of survival, meaning the environment favors those that survive. So in directional selection, what happens is one extreme is favored. In an example in the textbook, anteaters and the length of their tongue. That would be the x-axis, the length of an anteater's tongue. Average tongues and below average tongues are not favored for. So their survival rate, or getting ants, I guess that's their mode of, of uh, nutrition, large or long-tongued anteaters, which would be over here on the graph, would have the best success. So that's directional. There is another scenario where, in some cases, below average. All right. So those are both directional, where one extreme of a phenotype is favored. And that second example would have to be another example where a below average scenario would occur. Stabilizing selection, which is the middle, is where the average, so the same labels are on the x and y axis, so the average is favored. In a textbook example, we have, um, they use salamanders potentially as the example where they say small salamanders are too small to get away from their prey because they're so small they can't run fast. And the large ones, are they stand out too much, so they're easy prey. The average is best. So that's a stabilizing example. And then we have disruptive. Disruptive is where the extremes are favored, meaning the average is where you don't want to be. So you can kind of say that's your average right there. An example that the textbook uses are a, a type of limpet, which is apparently a shelled organism. And in the water, the light colored, which would be the below average in this scenario for a color distribution, the light ones actually blend in for the organisms that their predator is on the bottom and they're looking up, so they kind of blend in with the skyline and the sun, so they survive. The dark ones on the far right, actually, they have darkness on the top of their shell, so therefore organisms that are swimming over them can actually survive because um, what's the, the dark of the floor kind of makes them stand as a little camouflage. The organisms that are in between kind of can't camouflage with the sun and can't camouflage with the ground, so therefore they kind of get eaten and it's not good to be average in that scenario. So those are all one example in class. I unfortunately gave many more examples because we had more time. I only have 15 minutes for this. But those are scenarios that you should look for in the test, you would have to kind of just identify what is uh, this example an example of. So if you have one example for each, use them as your basis for studying. The next thing is speciation. And speciation is the um, process of creating or making a new species. So I'm not going to necessarily write everything I have here. You're going to have to listen to the instructions here, but this is the, the format of the notes. So speciation is the creation of a new species. There are two definitions for what a species is. In a biological concept, two organisms are in the same species if they can mate and their offspring are fertile. Think of two organisms that can't mate with each other. A tree, an oak tree, and a monkey. They can't mate with each other. Very obvious they're not in the same species. There are some organisms that can mate and have kids but their kids are no longer fertile. They are infertile. The best example would be a horse and a donkey. Horse and a donkey are not in the same species. They're close enough that they can mate, but their offspring, which is a mule, is an infertile organism. It cannot mate with itself, not meaning another mule. There is no ability for it to produce any more children. Um, so that's a biological concept. They can have children, and their children can have more children. In some cases, we can't base it on if they can mate because some organisms are extinct. 
Some organisms aren't around for us to test this. So they do a morphological concept. And a morphological concept is species might be in the same, two organisms might be in the same species if they look alike. So we have to do that with extinct organisms because we can't test their ability to mate. Other times, we also can't do that with asexually reproducing organisms because they don't have the ability, they don't use that process to mate. So therefore, prokaryotic organisms might have to be grouped according to what they look like. So what is going to create these new species? There are these things called isolating mechanisms. And isolating mechanisms are barriers that help create species. The first grouping are prezygota. That means before a zygote, and a zygote is a fertilized egg. So to make it prezygotic, these are barriers that have to prevent a sperm and egg from uniting. There are five examples I will discuss. The first is a geographical. And geography, think of a land barrier. This could be a mountain. If a mountain stands between two organisms, they are not going to be able to mate. Humans have the ability to get over mountains and, you know, there is no, there is no geography on this planet that potentially separates. But for some organisms, that would be a barrier. And if you keep a species on one side of the mountain from ever reaching the other side, then two, over millions of years, these two sides of the organism, the mountains might produce different species because of mutations and the evolution of them. And this is not overnight. It has to be over millions of years. But they can create two different species. This is exactly what happened with Darwin's and his finches. So the islands of the Galapagos were too far away, so they didn't intermix with each other. So the organisms didn't ever mate with each other. So they, over the course of millions of years, separated for that long, and they no longer were able to interbreed with each other when they got back together. Seasonal or temporal is where mating seasons are at different times. So humans mate 24, you know, there is no mating season for a human, but for some organisms, their breeding season might be in a particular month. So if two organisms mate at two different times, they're never going to be able to mate and because a sperm's not going to wait for an egg. So therefore, seasonal or temporal is where you have two organisms. One might mate in the fall, one might mate in the spring. Their sperm and egg will never meet. Ecological. Ecological is where an organism chooses to live in an environment. So think of organisms and their choice. Some choose to live in a, a cold environment, some choose to live in a tropical environment. Those two organisms don't even know they exist because they don't move to that other environment. So these organisms will never have the opportunity for a sperm and egg to unite if they live in two different... They do this voluntarily, um, but that's just the idea. So it's not geographical. Geographical is they are prevented by some physical barrier, maybe a mountain range, as I said, or a body of water. But ecological, they kind of choose to be there. Behavioral, um, it's called behavioral because it's such as behavior. So certain behaviors like the mating uh, ritual dance of, as I said, a bird, they have to you know, create this certain dance for another female to recognize it as being its own species. And if what starts to happen, they have a difference dance, they're not going to mate, they would not mate with each other. Um, think of behaviors like the, the, you know, strongest male lion, what that's going to do. You have to have certain behaviors to mate with the female. Uh, so if they don't recognize it, maybe some flies like the firefly has a certain uh, pattern of its light pattern. So these are all things that are behavioral based. A call, those are, are behaviors that could prevent a sperm and egg from uniting. And finally, structural is based on reproductive structures. And what this says is that if two reproductive structures do not fit, some insects have a lock and key, very specific shape, so that the, the copulatory organs have to mate. They are going to have to fit perfectly. So the best example I kind of use, um, you know, hypothetically is like a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. They're not going to mate. That sperm and egg will never mate because of the structural difference of the reproductive organs between those two organisms. So in the next video, I'm going to quickly wrap it up with what are post-zygotic. You'll see that's the next thing in your notes, but I will do that in the next video.